various contexts. Thank you, Noble. Hello, and thank you everyone for investing your afternoon. I hope everyone's learning a lot. Um, it's been a phenomenal set of presentations so far. Uh, Peter Norvig um, helped us understand how these things work. Um, Alan uh, gave us some insights as to how to talk to these th to, to generative AI solutions. Um, Victor just now sort of showed us a practical example uh, of how the in showing the power of these tools. And, and I'm going to sort of just take a beat, a left turn and sort of show how, you know, in an applied sense, we're also using um, these tools in the enterprise. Um, this talk, uh, if, if the title sounds familiar, is from a Taurus Data Science publication that I wrote in February. Uh, and so we'll jump right into it. And thanks again uh, for the organizers uh, and everyone involved for putting this together. All right. So uh, to get to done in about 30 minutes uh, or 20, um, we, we, I will be, you'll be taking away why uh, unreliability of these generative AI systems uh, erodes trust uh, in the systems that we build with generative AI. Uh, it's an opinionated take. Uh, from an enterprise context, uh, I want to show how these systems are used. So it's a field report of some sort. Uh, I'm going to then uh, sort of use examples to, to share why uh, these systems behave the way they do and why they're unreliable information sources and uh, stores. And then, of course, share what is being done uh, about that, at least in the context of my line of work. Uh, and so I will, of course, leave some key takeaways and some links and resources at the end of the talk. And I'll, I, I hope to post this uh, slide uh, when I'm ready to share it. All right, so generative AI tools, we've heard a lot about them today. Uh, they're you know large language models, super powerful, right? Um, there's a chance that these tools will be ubiquitous or ambient in our lives if they're not already. The notion that the, based on how they work, that an autoregressive system that lacks a cognitive architecture or deductive reasoning, the notion that these things are blind to what they know they know and what they know they don't know, would that those would be incorporated into consumer, like search, for example, um, actually terrifies me. <laughs> and continues to terrify me uh, because of the world that we live in with, you know, misinformation, disinformation, that kind of stuff. And this is a concern for enterprises, right? Uh, and so generative, in my opinion, it's a generative AI will always be an unreliable store. These systems are improving though. Uh, and so um, as you can see on the screen, one of the first things I do with any new state of the art model, this was back in February, uh, I, Ego surf. I Google myself of sorts uh, and try to find out what the system knows about me. It's a very egotistical practice, but what way to evaluate uh, a few shot or zero shot uh, approach uh, to testing a response by searching for something that you know a lot about, which is me. Um, but and so it back then it told me I was dead. I, I was a successful entrepreneur that actually died. There are some half truths in there, and that's almost a blueprint for misinformation if you not if you do not know what you're working with. And so that's why it sort of frightens me uh, in, 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 to, to be incorporated, tightly incorporated into search. But jokes on you, ChatGPT, at least the earlier version of it back in February, because I'm still alive, I think I am. Uh, I'm the director of product uh, at Ventera Corporation, which is a technology firm in Northern Virginia. And I work with federal customers, uh, try to be responsible in how we incorporate data uh, and, AI models into into production, into production applications to her uh, to help U.S. Uh, taxpayers every day. Uh, on my personal side, I also uh, run a company called Byte and Atom Research, uh, where I work with um, you know mid-sized enterprises to help them think through their tr uh, data trust strategy. Um, and I, you know, uh, and in that, I'm just focused on you know bringing reliable, trustworthy, and responsible data governance to applied 
learning context. So Biden Adam Research is essentially an applied research firm, uh, applied research and development firm. Uh, and so that's about me. This stuff that I'm about to talk to talk to you about today is how, what makes my heart sing, right? I want to be a great ancestor to these ubiquitous tools, uh, that tools that are eventually going to be ambient for me, my children that you see here, and, and you, right? Uh, so let's dive right in. As I was listening to all the previous talks, I started trimming down back my slides <laughs> because uh, it was well covered. Uh, and so I'm going to sort of breeze through some slides. So I hope you don't mind. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be intentional when referencing foundation models or base models uh, versus generative, generative AI or GPTs uh, and try to focus the conversation on large language models in an enterprise context. Normally, when I do this, I sort of separate sort of external LLMs, which our enterprises have no control over, uh, often, you know, uh, API only access model type models like Cohere, uh, Anthropic, and, and, and some of the, the offerings by uh, Google Cloud Services and Vertex. And then if you've got, you've got your, uh, you know, internal uh, LLMs like, um, uh, you know, Meta 2, and which if you've been following uh, on Tuesday, uh, Google Cloud uh, announced uh, was now available or would be soon available in the model garden uh, that I believe Alan talked about uh, as well. So that's great for the types of customers that I serve. Uh, foundation models, put simply, are trained on a ton of data. I'm not going to go into too many details because just watch Peter's uh, talk. Um, you know, they can be further tuned by the time you receive it for specific tasks. So you've got, you know, uh, Palm 2, and then you've got MedPalm for specific tasks for medical applications. And really briefly how these base models, these foundation models are, um, are trained, they're trained on academic uh, um, corpus. And so we're talking legal uh, documents, uh, patents, medical journals, general internet scraping uh, or, or crawling the web for Reddit and Twitter and pretty much any other uh, service provider that is now locking down their APIs. That was a joke. Um, you know, Project Gutenberg. So we're talking like books and novels and, and code repos, uh, Stack Overflow, math, uh, YouTube media, that kind of stuff. And so foundation models can take the form of text, images for audio synth synthesis, videos like what Runway uh, is doing, uh, stable diffusion for images and, and, and that kind of stuff, right? In some cases, like with BARD, you might mix two modalities together and you'll get uh, a generative AI solution that uh, leverages, you know, uh, computer vision and the power of, um, you know, large language models as well. Okay. Uh, I promised a field report of some sort. So here, the res end result of, you know, the technologies behind uh, large language models or foundational uh, found foundation models are very useful in the enterprise. I bucketed them. This is not exhaustive. Uh, they fall into in information retrieval, automation and efficiency, content generation. And to date, since I sort of jumped into to you know uh, you know generative AI, I've seen impressive demos. Uh, I've seen tons of, I've built some of them uh, and they always sort of wow the room and everyone goes, gets that fuzzy feeling as to the power of these, uh, these tools. Uh, and, but <laughs> in the enterprise context, the cost for an enterprise to ship a generative AI solution without consideration for factual correctness, repeatability in development, consistency and reliability is high enough to require guardrails of some sort, uh, tests, safety mechanisms, uh, automation for reasons we'll get into. But before then, let's talk about some ways that these systems can be unreliable because that's provocative. It gets you going. That's why you're here. Now, lots of reasons. I've cut out a, a couple slides that sort of go deep into this for time. Uh, but I'll boil it down to three things. Um, so I'm breaking down my thesis. Um, what really inspired this talk, like I was talking about, was my fear that uh, generative AI was going to be incorporated into search. So I'm going to use that to sort of frame my argument here. Uh, people look to search engines for fact. I don't care what you're doing, right? I 
typed in Noble Ackerson in Google just to see if there's anything. So try Googling yourself. You've done it a million times. I'm not the only egotistical person in the room. And if you find something inaccurate, guess what? There's a whole industry aimed at fixing errors on those links. You can't do that easily with a large language model. So left and checked, these probabilistic, stochastic nature of uh, Gen AI could lead to more misinformation, disinformation, and societal harm. Yes, I know that these systems are being improved. And there's some UI tricks and, and, and user experience techniques that, say, for example, Google's new search experience is introducing where it, it's very smart as to when it uses uh, a, a, a Gen AI response versus when it filters down links for you. And I think that's very innovative. And so these issues are boiled down into probability. Again, you know, you know, the, there's some element of randomness in, in how these systems, are, uh, before you get a response, are rewarded uh, based on making the best guess on the tokens that came before it and, the, and also ultimately based on the data that they're trained on, right? So prompt design, uh, and I'll get into this at the end of this talk, is very critical. Um, you put in a garbage uh, prompt, you'll get sexist, racist, and toxic uh, uh, responses out. And Alan was really good at uh, explaining all of that. But also knowledge gaps, you know, uh, quite famously, OpenAI talks about how um, they're, they're uh, their, their models were not trained past 2021, September, right? Uh, and, and that's important because when I go in and I type in into some of these systems, what is an LLM? Believe it or not, even though these systems are powered by LLMs, it will not know what an LLM is. Sometimes it might get it right, but most of the time it'll get it wrong. They also overfit, right? Which means the responses have a behavior that repeat the exact copies of the text that they were trained upon, right? And that leads to situations where Sarah Silverman, a, community, a comedian in the United States, might sue uh, a company. So imagine if you're a little startup building your Gen AI tools and Sarah Silverman, Silverman comes and says, you've just ripped off my entire book. You're out of business, right? And so enterprises are very, very cautious. Uh, and, and when I talk to them, they, they understand that in some cases, they may not have full control over these systems. So they come to someone like me to sort of help them think through uh, uh, you know, ways to solve these problems. And so with that, let's talk about what to do about it. I think I'm about 15 minutes in, so I think we can get through this. Before I go on though, um, I wanna stress that we've heard a lot about large language models and we are seeing so many innovations with large language models, but a model is not the product. Let me repeat, the model is not the product. The Gen AI, the generative AI solutions that you integrate into real software to solve real problems is the product, right? And so I'm going to zoom in uh, into this uh, framework uh, that I designed for my customers, um, where these are essentially checkpoints, um, where you have you know, your data input and your system input, where you're looking to mitigate any potential issues in your, in your data inputs, uh, your actual pipeline uh, in order to sort of solve the problem. There's some evaluation techniques that you need to do. We'll, we'll take a look at that. And of course, if you um, sort of include experts to sort of review the outputs of these tools, as uh, Victor was talking about before, there's some techniques that we'll go over. And so with this in mind, I'm going to be zooming in and out of every single one of these, uh, hopefully in about 10 minutes. All right. So, um, you know, you've built your fancy demo, you work for Corporation X and you're solving a specific problem and you've built your tool. Um, there are many paths to tame the unreliability and let's define unreliability for the sake of this conversation as factual correctness, right? Um, there are many ways to sort of tame it. Uh, and so I designed this framework to help my customers sort of um, think through what they need to do to adapt their existing machine learning operations pipelines or sort of build new ones uh, to, to help sort of rein in uh, the uh, uncertainty uh, with, with outputs in these systems, right? Again, one, you, I have the word fine tuning here, which you've probably heard a lot about. Um, fine tuning does not teach your models new, new, lang uh, new knowledge. Uh, the goal of uh, uh, model tuning or fine tuning uh, is to further improve the performance of, of the model for a specific task. So 
uh, you know, even with that med palm example, once you start integrating it, you can actually fine tune that uh, on top of uh, you know, fine tune that against uh, your large, uh, your private data uh, against that, that large, that large language model. Okay. Uh, and so again, back to those, those, uh, that systems, we can actually dive into zoom into the data input and the system input and the system output. Okay. Again, lots of hype, um, seen some impressive demos with LLMs. Uh, but again, they fall over the instant someone tries to use them within an enterprise context. Uh, and it's pretty tough to sort of rein in the, these things. So we're going to sort of zoom in further into, you know, did the data preparation part, uh, the fine tuning, if you need it uh, part, testing and deployment. Uh, then we'll move uh, next into your application pipeline, which is often a streaming pipeline. All right, so um, you can imagine this architecture being applied if you do uh, choose to use, a, you know, GCP to host it. It works similarly. You just sort of swap in available services within that ecosystem. Okay. All right. So in practice, within the enterprise, you know, they're bringing in their spe domain specific data sets. So help desk has, you know, chatbot data, chatbot data, or conversations. Uh, reviews for their for their tools. Those are domain specific data sets. Um, for you know, I've got feedback uh, data here, um, which is not necessarily R uh, RLHF, which is reinforcement learning with human feedback. That's actually different. That's a mistake. Um, but this feedback is literally from your users, right? So to give your model that imp improvement flywheel. So for example, incorporating ratings or comments on generated text quality uh, to improve your model's behavior. That's why, why you have that. And then lastly, um, there might be more for you, but you know, uh, uh, you know, data from your security and safety team, so logs uh, and, and previous red teaming example to sort of augment your red or purple team's activities to further uh, robust, uh, make your, your uh, system a little bit more robust to adversarial attacks, right? And so then I'm not going to go, I'm going to get into further detail, but what I want to highlight here is, you know, one big checkpoint, uh, another big checkpoint is your evaluation. Another big checkpoint is, you know, how you test this before you um, have your application pipeline ingest um, this. And, and when things are not right after you're testing, you know, you have a redeployment trigger using your, you know, uh, cloud build or I'm sorry, your, your CI CD pipeline of some sort. All right. I, I forgot to mention um, for your data versioning, you might want to use DVC or data version control or whatever is equivalent in your uh, environment. All right. So now you, you sort of served uh, your solution. You want to ensure that you have real reliability checkpoints along the application pipeline as well. Alan talked about that a little bit, but let's sort of briefly look at you know, a, a, an oversimplistic tool uh, uh, um, sort of pathway. What I'm going to focus on is uh, mostly uh, some of the techniques to ensure reliability. And I'll sort of, and very next, I'll sort of show you one example. Uh, some people use uh, embeddings uh, based on data that is uploaded, uh, or it might use a database, or probably use an agent uh, where it's basically an API call. Uh, so essentially, your uh, generative AI solution becomes a, um, you know, um, uh, you know, sort of smart with sort of crawling, you know, accessing uh, a, a predetermined system that has a RESTful API already on there. Of course, with all of this stuff, you need feedback loops uh, for your, um, your team and that probably gets stored in Feast or whatever feature store uh, that you may have within your ecosystem. Uh, but as part of that whole flow, your, your user makes a request, uh, goes through some magic, and you, which Alan has talked about, uh, and you get uh, a response back. One um, emergent technique uh, this year uh, in uh, making generative pre-trained models reliable, especially in the enterprise, even though it's not foolproof, and I'll explain why, uh, is something called retrieval, retrieval augmented generation or RAG. And for the past few months, a bunch of uh, novel 
approaches to help tame these uh, the unreliability of these models have come through. And in simple terms, a RAG is a technique uh, to update the AI's knowledge, right? Or let me, I flipped the last image that you saw, uh, you know, vertically so that you, uh, or horizontally, so you can sort of see it from the sort of user's uh, standpoint as I go through this. So again, you sometimes you may want to add recent external knowledge. Uh, say, for example, some of my initial demos for my customers were um, just semantic search example or sort of a rag example uh, without consideration that, you know, within the enterprise, you know, new data, new knowledge is being added to a knowledge store every minute, right? Uh, and especially in larger organizations. Uh, and so you need a pipeline to sort of scale um, your data store uh, at the end of this stuff. And so a retrieval augmented generation um, pipeline is very important. And sometimes, you know, depending on your ecosystem, you may have um, some tooling to sort of stitch this together. Uh, there's some open source uh, solutions out there like Llama Index or Langchain as was talked about before uh, to help you sort of stitch all of this together so that when a user makes an uh, user makes a, 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 you know, a request of your system, uh, you're able to get the latest and freshest information in order to, to give them a factually accurate uh, in the way that we're defining it for this talk. Uh, but it's not a silver bullet because there is, you know, if you're fetching real time data from a database uh, using, you know, uh, uh, Postgres or, you know, uh, a PG vector, one of those types of tools, uh, there's going to be latency. Um, you know, you have to do some checks. And then I'll also talk about other techniques there in a second. I just want to sort of speed up a little bit for time. There's data quality uh, issues. Now you're allowing this massively powerful you know, galaxy scale trained LLM to only to adapt its knowledge onto your private data, right? So if the, your data quality sucks, um, well, you're gonna get more inaccuracy. So that's a drawback. Uh, there's complexity uh, in there because, you know, we we're talking about Langchain, and Llama Index and this thing, and you know, ABAC and RBAC and all that stuff. There's gonna be complexity and with complexity comes cost. So, um, so I've walked you through the data input, the system input, the, the pipelines. Now let's talk about the system output and the product uh, output, right? Uh, so for data, you want to employ, you, you've employed methods uh, to sort of address hopefully missing or inconsistent data. You, you put in a pipeline in there. You've added a little bit more complexity, but now you're starting to, 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 to work on sort of the application pipelines uh, how your system interacts with humans. Uh, and I love Alan's talk, uh, not because I'm, you know we're friends, uh, because it sort of helps me sort of cut the corners as to how to make these things reliable. So what I swapped some of my code slides with was something that I'm um, researching for a book that I'm coming back with, uh, which is um, you know the importance of talking or speaking to uh, these systems. Uh, I believe Ilya Sutskova of, of, of OpenAI said, you know, the powerful, most powerful programming language um, is English. And so this is normalized that to say is language, um, just to be more inclusive. But language is hard. <laughs> Conversation is hard. And in the late 60s, uh, a professor, a, a philosopher um, called Paul Grice identified something called the cooperative principle. And uh, he's a well-renowned linguist. And so one thing that I want to sort of leave with you is sort of think about some of the lessons that he taught um, when you're sort of crafting your system from a developer experience or, or just sort of things that you want to account for when you're evaluating how your users are interacting with your solution from the uh, CX or the, this customer experience or the user experience, right? And so Paul Grice talks about four maxims, right? He talks about quality, quantity, relevance, and manner. For quality, we want to talk about, you know, he, he's focusing on how truthful we are. For quantity, he's talking about how informative we are, there's relevance. And with manner, he's talking about how clear we are. And these are can be used as sort of reliable guidelines when you are in doing your in-context learning or prompt engineering um, and on how you sort of frame your prompts. And so, you know, when you want to... Uh, 
put a simple example, overly simple example, when you sort of want to sort of train it to sort of say, tell me about AI. Uh, that may, uh, you know, for, you know, the, the quality uh, or even the quantity uh, maxim, you may want to sort of think of a, something like being a little bit more uh, illustrative, like, you know, explain the key principles of machine learning and just sort of provide it with examples as Alan and Victor were talking about earlier. So this aligns with your models in context learning or prompt engineering abilities, allowing it to generate more targeted and useful information. Another technique to sort of rein in, you know, what you may not be able to control, uh, right? Uh, note that we note what I'm doing here. You weren't able to control the inputs, right, with your data, with the interacting with the large language model, but we constrained it and made it a little smart with things like RAG and vector databases, that kind of stuff. And then how your users are going to uh, work with this thing also is a little unpredictable. You have no control over it because you can account for uh, 99 different scenarios to sort of protect your system. I guarantee you launch your, your app and you ship and you pop your champagne. They're going to find a hundred uh, one way to break your system. Uh, right. And so there's tools like guardrails uh, to uh, that allows you to add structure type and quality guarantees to your large language model outputs. And because whoever came up with guardrails is super smart, the Rails part is called reliable markup language. And there's a guardrails, getguardrails.ai uh, is one. This image here is from NVIDIA, who uh, recently launched uh, Nemo. And so you're using these Rails languages uh, as sort of a buttress uh, for your solution uh, to define things like the data types that your um, your users are going to be interacting with, corrective actions uh, to validate and correct LLMs before generating a response. So you've probably heard how other LLMs do it. You know, when you're using it, it says, "As an AI, I can't talk about politics." You know, so think about you know those types of solutions as well. Let's land this plane. So to land this plane, we talk about some key takeaways, right? Uh, we've talked about, you know, um, your data inputs, your system inputs, your system outputs, and your product outputs. The, here are some mitigation techniques that we look at, robust metrics and security measures for the data input, task decomposition, uh, feedback loops, guardrails, or defensive UX uh, for the uh, system I.O. And then, of course, product output uh, has, you know, I, I want to sort of go back to um, I cut out a slide here, but you want to sort of properly explain or clearly explain what your system can and can't do. And then, you know, allow your users to opt out um, or, uh, uh, you know, correct, you know, any issues or give you feedback as, as you're going along. I won't get into this too much. I can think I'm at time or maybe close to it. Uh, and so these are methods uh, for reliability uh, and some continued research. You will see some of this um, data come out uh, over uh, the next couple months as I sort of get to close to publishing my book sometime next year, if I get time. And I want to leave you with some resources because, you know, why not? Um, I will make these slides available. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work, that, uh, research uh, that you can apply, and I'm going to make that available for you. That's my gift. Um, and yes, yeah, so we can conclude. You know how we test our, you know, our prompts. How we sort of put guardrails around our systems. Regardless of what we do, that conversation with the machine uh, is very important. Uh, so it's worth revisiting. You know. Uh, linguists and, and, you know, just sort of mapping some, you know, being a creative technology, sort of map some out of domain context to what you're trying to do when uh, conversation, convert, uh, having your users converse with your generative AI solution. And that is my talk. If you want to read about uh, the full context of my talk, it's a short read uh, and it's going to be on my medium. Um, sorry for shilling so much. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, questions, uh, let me see, try to pull up my questions here. Oh gosh, uh, let's see. Is there any standards for testing the capabilities of LLM based on task types? I think we're, <laughs> I may be wrong here. I don't know the answer to this question, but I'm going to go on a limb to say we're in the Wild West uh, where there are no standards yet. Um, there are some good 
best practices. If you sort of look at some of the resources uh, that I provided, uh, evaluation uh, using uh, benchmarks, uh, publicly available benchmarks is one. Um, at some point, you notice I had A-B testing. Um, so depending on your use case, uh, you may want to get experts uh, if you can afford it uh, to help evaluate, help you evaluate uh, or test uh, the responses in your system. Excellent presentation, Noble. Just a quick okay. question. And so in implementing RAG, so retrieval augmented generation, <clears throat> Um, of course, one of the challenges that I see is that, like, especially when you try to do it, is it's, um, in some cases, it can actually hurt performance. And so your ability to retrieve the right documents sort of has this outsized effect on the sort of value you get overall out of that whole experience. And so, like, um, do you tend to see things like that? Like, how often do you see uh, challenges like that sort of coming up? just in general? There are tons of challenges and I think I scratched the surface. Um, so I cut a lot of slides back. I, I also have a similar example with semantic search. So um, I'll be talking about this a lot uh, this fall at Voice and AI, actually with Alan. Uh, but to your question, you know, outside of, you know, latency, data quality, complexity and cost, there's also security risks, you know, so fetching data from external sources, um, some can potentially pose security risks like data breaches or unauthorized access, if that sort of goes to your question. And so add, you have to add more complexity. Right? Yeah. Uh, you have to look at role-based access controls or, or right. attribute-based access controls and sort of incorporate yeah. that as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. I think that's a great point um, because you don't want the LLM answering questions using data that that user should not have access to. So, right. Yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I didn't have time to get into all of it, but right. you're absolutely right. It is a nightmare, uh, especially when you have, you know, you're what I one good question that I got from someone who knew nothing about the system. They were impressed at the demo, um, a construction firm that I helped out. But then they go, so what do we do with our, our, our Postgres database uh, and our systems? Because it already has all those checks, <laughs> all those sort of gates um, where they have an ABAC sort of protocol in there, not just based on the role of the user, but certain attributes should, that should be exposed to the user. Well, none of, you know, and of course, my response was, well, this is a demo. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks again for your presentation. Awesome. Thank you both. And uh, thank you so much, Novo. Um, we are almost at the end of our session. So this is our last session with um, with Maddie. So we're going to talk about open 